you are here. Thank you. Well, it took a little while. Uh, uh, not so trippy colors anymore. Uh, anyhow, my name is Joachim Stromerson. I'm here to talk about something called the Tilitis Tiki. Uh, what we hope is a radical open authentication platform that fits in your pocket. And I will talk a little bit about uh, what it is, how it came about, and why we think it's uh, probably going to interest you, I hope. Anyhow, so short about myself. Uh, as I said, my name is Joachim Strobergsson. I come from a IT security company here in Gothenburg called Assured. Uh, uh, my focus is on embedded and hardware security and crypto stuff. Uh, I'm mostly blue teaming. I do like to make break things, uh, but I also like, and um, probably more so, to build things. I've been working in uh, digital hardware design, doing FPGAs and ASICs and system design for at least 30 years. So I'm one of the old guys. Uh, I've been releasing open source hardware uh, designs for, I checked it for, for about 30, 10 years now. And you can find me on, on GitHub and SecWorks. Uh, and I'm focusing on releasing crypto related functionality like the AS block cipher and SHA-256 hash functions and stuff like that. Uh, just to mention a couple of projects I've been involved in, uh, I've been in the Cryptech Open Hardware Security Module project for a number of years as a core team as the FB designer. And uh, we're going to talk a bit about, about black boxes and, and uh, the Cryptech HSM is a, trying to break up what is the real, when it comes to security, the perennial black box in the world. This is the things that, that creates all the certificate authorities. You can keep the keys in and generates CAs for you. And they are with the design black boxes. If you try to open up an HSM from, for example, IBM or, or, or SafeNet uh, or Thales, they will break. That's the point of them. So you can't know what's inside of them and actually check them out. So ISOC and ITF started the Cryptic HSM project to build an open HSM. Uh, another project is the NetNode MTS Network Time Security Server. This is not one thing that, that secures the, the time uh, reference in Sweden, that you can go to MTS NTP servers and know that you get, get correct time. Uh, that machine there is handling 4 by 10 gigabit giga, giga per second streaming data through it, and it contains about 128 or almost 200 AES cores inside of it to be able to do this stream anyway. Uh, and you can go to GitHub and, and uh, download the source code for, for that design also. But that's it. Uh, let's talk about Tilidis. Tilidis is a company. Uh, it is, uh, but I'm, I'm coming to where it started, but, but this, the basic for this was uh, working at, at Mulvad, the VPN provider from Gothenburg. Uh, Mulvad is a big user, is a big sponsor and believer in open source security, as openness as, as, as being a way to get security and trust. So Mulvad is, for example, sponsoring the Tor project, WireGuard, SDBoot, and a lot of other projects, and also research. Uh, and Mulvad is publishing a lot of open source, so you can go to GitHub on Mulvad and you can find a lot of the work that they're doing. Uh, one of the things that was this, at Moonwall is a group called the Trusted Computing Research that tries to find ways of making it possible for you as a user to be able to trust Moonwall as a VPN provider, to be able to, to, be able to transparently see the, what's running at Moonwall and what's not running at Moonwall, and how we can sort of lock down and secure the machines that are deployed all over the world. Uh, so we started looking at the hardware-based route of trust and be able to measure from reset the, the, the VPN relays, the, the first instruction assured or measured boot. Uh, and normally people do this by using what's called TPMs, Trusted Platform Modules, those tiny, tiny chips that you plug into your PC, for example, in your server. Uh, and a bit like the HSMs, they are black boxes. Uh, you can't open up, you, you basically have to need to trust them uh, that they are doing what they say they're doing. Uh, and as we know, evil hides in the dark, uh, so we started trying to look at well, can, how can we build a minimal TPM ourselves that does exactly what we need to do but nothing else. We call that TPM-ish. Uh, and we want to do this in hardware ourselves. So we started looking at how can we build a really minimal trust, a root of trust uh, that has just do one thing and let's start there and then build on that. 
Uh, so we did this uh, assigner uh, called the, uh, the Mulvac Trust Anchor 1. Um, and it's basically a single hard coded application. It, it runs software inside of it, but it only has that in, in ROM. You can't load any software on it. Uh, it has a single per device, use, uh, per device unique key pair, and it performs the ED2519 ED side operation. And it has a small risk side, risk five processor inside of it, and, and then hardware that implements the API. So the software can't actually not directly receive any commands. It goes through hardware all the time. Uh, this design is also available on GitHub, the MT1 signer. But during the development of, of the MT1 signer, we thought, of course, that this is a neat platform. And by the way, the, the board over there, that's the MT board. There's a PMOD connector to it. You can insert it into a, for example, a Raspberry Pi, something like that. It's about a size of like this, this whole board. Uh, and basically just the FPGA uh, on there. Uh, but we started with, okay, it's a neat platform. Uh, what we, we could actually run other software on this. We do other authentication and identification uh, solutions on it. Uh, so we start looking at what are the minimum requirements for general authentication platform. Well, we need to be able to have secure application execution, and we need to be able to have some application running on it. We need to be able to have sort of secure data handling, at least non-persistent on it. Uh, we need to have access to random numbers. We use random numbers for padding, for IVs, for generate keys and new challenges and all kinds of stuff. We also need some sort of uh, knowledge of time. If you think of, for example, a, a time-based OTP protocol, for example, we need to be able to at least count seconds to be able to count for like 30 seconds and then do another TOTP generation. Uh, and we also like to have this, if you want to be able to enhance the users, we also really want to have the knowledge of user presence, some way of actually having sort of a button or something like that. Uh, but going from the, the single-use board thing here to, to something else, that be able to have in general, the key issue really becomes how do we load and trust applications onto this device. Uh, while we're thinking about this, uh, the TCU, so a couple of TCU projects were spun out from Mulvad into a couple of uh, sister companies. This was done in, in mid-2022, so uh, a little more than a year ago, uh, uh, less than a year ago. Uh, uh, and one of those is, is Glasgow Technique, uh, that developed and maintained the SIGSUM and System Transparency projects. They are really cool, you should check them out. Uh, we want to be able to use these to be able to further secure our uh, delivery uh, in the future, by the way. Uh, and then Teletus was created, a company that develop and provide T-keys, the general version of, of the MTA devices, and applications and services around that. Uh, so we started up in, well, just after summer, uh, summer last year. Uh, so coming back to the question of how can we load and trust uh, applications, uh, there's uh, an interesting sort of uh, Microsoft to the rescue, uh, interesting enough. Uh, Microsoft have been looking at, at really robust IoT solutions for, for a long time and really, really constrained systems. And how can you, as a, uh, when talking to an IoT system, how can you trust it? Uh, and they're looking at trusted boot for these constrained devices and talking about both the software and hardware integrity. Uh, and their solution, uh, which we have sort of adopted, is that we actually measure the application while it's being loaded onto the device. Uh, so it means that we create a cryptographic hash of the application loaded. Uh, and we combine that with a unique device secret called UCS. And we also can additionally accept a, a secret supplied by the user or the client system called USS. And based on that, we derive a base secret that the application that has been loaded can use for whatever reason it needs. For example, generate keys. Uh, and that means that the CDI really depends on integrity of the application. It depends on the UDS, that is the hardware, and also the USS, that is the, basically the knowledge of the users. So we locked it down with, with multi-factor. And that allows us to basically take develop applications that do whatever needed to do for use case and load onto the device. And this is the Teletus key, and yeah, it's not for scale, it actually looks 
that big. Uh, uh, and if I look at the close up here, uh, basically it is just one big chip, that's an FPGA there, and uh, some support functions for basically for, for the USB to serial conversion uh, that we have in a chip for a moment, uh, and then power supply. and. and so inside of that FPGA, we have a CPU, we have firmware in ROM, we also have a small firmware ROM, uh, and a few other things. And we're going to look a bit in more detail about those things. But basically, it's, it's a small computer system inside of that FPGA. Uh, and so we have the, uh, the CPU, is a 32-bit CPU, it's a core Pico RV32, it's an open core. Uh, we have added to it, uh, be able to have fast publication and fast shifting operations, uh, so we can do it with a barrel shifter. That means that we support the ZMAUL subset uh, of the math uh, extension of, of, of RISC-V. Uh, so we have a firmware in ROM and also a specific explicit, uh, separate exclusive RAM for the firmware to operate in. The firmware is 4 kilobytes. Uh, we have a memory controller that uh, checks uh, that handles all the communication inside of it. Uh, and we have a firm mode and application mode. And when you reset, where we actually insert your, your Tiki in a client, it will start in firm mode. And when the application is loaded, it will switch over to application mode, starting application. And the memory system locks down how the memory interface me memory looks like, and there's no way to go back. You can't go back to the firmware unless you reset the device. Uh, the RAM in, that we're using for, for firmware and, and applications uh, has average space layer randomization protection, and we also have data scrambling to sort of add protection of, of, of the contents. Uh, there's 128 kilobytes of RAM inside this. You can build applications. Uh, that is up to 128k um, with their data. There's a timer to measure time. Uh, there's also a entropy source, a true random number generator, implemented as digital uh, ring oscillators that generates the entropy that you can harvest and, and drive uh, random generation. Uh, and this one is based on what we we using in, in the Cryptek HSL. Uh, there's a touch sensor. That is a capacity based, so there is no physical button on, on the casing. So you just push, put your finger on it and it will detect it. And there's a score that manages touch events, so you'll be able to wait for an event and reliably get an event. There's also a TK1, a Tilitus Key 1 uh, core that basically contains all of the stuff that we need for, uh, for running the, the, the FPGA. So this is where you can get the access to the, to, uh, to the what's called the UDI, the, the unique device identity, serial number if you want to, uh, and the CDI that was calculated by the firmware. So the applications can read out that one, but not write to it. Uh, there's also, the, uh, also an access point to, to the Blake2 hash function that's available for all applications. Uh, and there's the control for the security mechanisms that we are putting, for example, the ASLR and RAM scrambling part. Uh, and then there's a UART for the host communication, we have something like 64 kilobits right now. Uh, uh, and then there's the UDS, which is the memory for the unique device secret. And there's a special memory that we built that you can read once, so you can read out in any order, but you can never read out more than once. Uh, and that one is not available for, for the applications either. So it's only read by the firmware once and then calculate the CDI. So there's no way from us or anybody else to be able to build an application to read out the UDS. And that sort of gives the hardware security part of the integrity of the security of the hardware. Uh, some key use case examples. Uh, of course, authentication, identification, typical products like, like TOTP, HotPay, uh, SSH, OpenPGP could be supported, Passkey, Windows Hello. Uh, all the standards, and we are working on developing apps for that, and other people are also developing apps for us, for, for, for the Tiki. Uh, we can have root to trust, basically what we had from the start with MTA, with the ED2019 root, and TPMs. You could have implemented TPM on top of the Tiki. And also doing HSM-ish things, like secure enclaves and, and store keys and stuff like that. Though you need to 
figure out how to store things securely when you don't have the persistent memory. Uh, basically, wrap whatever you need to store and, and put it on the, on the client and be able to bring it back. Uh, interestingly, uh, we're looking at file and data protection. One of the things that was really cool is that we, we, we gave away uh, developer kits uh, at the uh, autumn and, and end of last year as part of uh, the Add to the Code uh, challenge. Uh, and it turned out there were some people in New York that developed something called Krypton, which is a file security uh, solution based on the Telitis key. And we found out that by the way, oh, it's, it's, we, we, we got a prize for this uh, in, in New York. We sort of the prize is really cool. But we could also do things like, like TLS offloading, uh, running a small uh, TLS stack in, in Tiki and offloading from IoT, for example. In general, we should be able to run Doom uh, on the Tiki. It has the performance to be able to do that, though there's not much on screen right now. Uh, and one of the key things with, uh, as I said, we started with, with Mulvad, and Mulvad really believes in, in open source, and we do also believe in open source. Uh, so the Tiki is open source, 100%. That means everything. That means going from, from the, the, the component list, the build materials, uh, the PCB design, uh, all the FPGA designs, all the firmware uh, code, all the software code that we have, and all the uh, support stuff we have, and documents. Uh, everything is 100% open source. Uh, and it also the tools that we use to develop the Tilitis key is all 100% open source. Uh, if I compare to the cryptic uh, product, which I talked about on, on FOSS uh, North 2019, it, uh, we used uh, Silex uh, FPDAs, and we had to use the Silex proprietary tools, ISC and Vivado. We used the Alcyon PCB designer tool, which also provided Terry, and uh, the main processor on the crypt on, on the uh, cryptic SSM is an STM32 microcontroller, uh, and has a lot of kitchen sinks, uh, a lot of like CAN interfaces and timers and. and all kinds of, of hardware cores inside of it that we don't use, and we don't really know if they somehow store information that we don't want to, have, want to leak out somehow. Uh, so that was sort of, we didn't reach in Encryptec the whole openness, but in, in, in Teletus we do that. Everything is 100% open source, uh, and has some consequences when we talk about that. So we're using, we have a system model running in Kimu. QEMU. Uh, we use Clang LVM uh, for, for all the C code. We use Go, for example. And, and the FBA toolchain is built around Anchors very long and very later for models and for, for core and system simulation. Uh, we use Yosis and XPNR uh, for synthesis and placing routes and mapping. Uh, and we use the iStorm tools for generating the bitstream. And we also use it for storing the device uh, storing the bitstream inside the configuration mem uh, memory uh, inside the FPGA. This is support for that has been developed as part of uh, the Tiki project. Uh, nobody actually done that before in an in, in open source uh, manner. And we use KiteCat for PC design. Uh, all the stuff that TD has developed is either DPLV2 or the CERN open hardware license. Uh, there are other cores inside of the uh, FPGA that is under other licenses, but uh, in general this is what we use. And as I said, the choosing to go the 100% open source tooling way sort of limits us to what kind of FPGAs we can use. Uh, there are more and more FPGAs uh, being supported by open source tools, but uh, when we started looking at this really hard, is that we ended up using the ICE40 Ultrafast device from, from Lattice. It has been supported by iStorm for a very, very long time. Uh, but it's a very, very tiny FPGA. It doesn't have very much resources. It has a little over 5,000 LUTs. Uh, it has a number of block RAMs. Uh, it has four big uh, memory blocks, down, uh, you see them down below, uh, that provides the memory that we use for applications. And those are only used for applications, nothing else. So they're open totally for the application. Uh, there is an internal clock uh, generator, which is really neat. We don't have to have clock outside. Uh, and as I said, there's an internal configuration memory, uh, the MVCM. And uh, you can store your, 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 you can insert your device, uh, your, your configuration into it, and then lock it down. Yeah. 
And there are some, also some uh, 60 by 60 multipliers that we use for the, to accelerate multiplications. Uh, but um, uh, these are easy and cheap to start with. You can get one of these eye sticks, for example, uh, for like, a, like 10, 15 euro probably. Uh, and really nice to start with and supported by many, many open source projects today. Uh, so going start working with SPDAs is really easy if you go with it. Uh, looking at the FBA tool performance, uh, uh, as I said, we're using USIS and, 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 and uh, Next PNR. And uh, what we can see is that the, the allocation, the ability to allocate resources on the FBDA is, is really working really well in Yosis. As uh, we, we can get high utilization, we look as we have, we allocate 91% of all the the, the logic resources in the FPGA. Uh, and we allocate all of the big memories, we allocate the, the clock generator, and as I said, it's a very, very full FPGA. And, uh, and, but it works, it goes really fast, it takes about two minutes to build a, a, the FPGA, compared to like ours, with, with an I, when we did in the Cryptic uh, implementation. What affects us a bit is that the uh, the timing module used in, in, in uses is a bit conservative. They don't have, of course, the same access to physical measurements as, as Lattice themselves have. Uh, but in general, it really works really nice. It really has a nice CLI. Uh, it's easy to, to automate with, with make and stuff like that, and extend as we need. So it works really nice. Uh, and one thing I do want to mention that shows a bit good uh, thing with, with open source hardware is that the, the, as I said, the, the CPU we're using is the Pika Army 32 uh, and it's an open core uh, and it allows us to uh, look at, be able to, to add or, or easily look at what's happening inside of the CPU core and build our own hardware around it. So one of the things that we wanted to do is to add stack and data protection you should not be able to execute instructions from, uh, from the data part of your uh, particular stack to be able to, to block against stack attacks. Uh, and we can easily build stuff that observe the internal state of the CPU. So we can observe when, when the CPU is trying to read an instruction uh, and we can detect that and act on it. Uh, and it also the, the CPU has a trap state so when it, it receives and it, it reads an illegal instruction, it will halt. It will we go to, in, in, uh, to a trap state and will stay there. And there's no way to go out of that state. So, uh, so it really nice if you, for what we want to do. That's really nice if you know that it's going to stay there. So we can build a small, small logic uh, inside FPGA that, that observes that this, the CPU is trying to read from areas that we define are not supposed to read instructions. Uh, and then when that happens, we basically just feed the CPU an illegal instruction and it traps. Uh, and we have this enabled for the firmware RAM memory all the time. And applications can define this by, by setting a start and an address and then enable the protection. So when the application defines its stack and where it wants to have the data, it can just define the reading about those, cover those, and enable it. Once enabled, you can't disable it. Uh, one thing that we've developed is a, an SSH agent uh, that runs on the client, i.e. your computer, uh, and it captures the SSH signing events uh, and then talks to, uh, talks to, to the T key that you inserted uh, and will use the signing application that we have to perform signing operations. It is available in package for Ubuntu in Debian. It's uh, and also been published at least for in Arch as a, a for documentation and how to do set up. It's available in Homebrew for macOS and just like yesterday, uh, got into Winget for for Windows. Uh, and basically, what you have is that you have the SPG in the bottom and then the uh, application loader, the ED two four nine nine signer, talking to the SSH agent uh, over the USB. Uh, and it waits for touch of events you need to you can do touch and also load uh, user supplied secrets uh, when setting up. The software environment for, for the Tiki uh, can uh, the client apps which are running on your 
computer or a server have basically written in the language. Uh, to lead us use Go to write them, but you can also use Python, for example, or whatever. Uh, uh, the software side, the, 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 if, uh, this really bare metal system, we don't provide any runtime, uh, we don't provide any uh, when, when the, the uh, we don't provide any uh, basic protocol for, for communication. Uh, the sign the sign error application contains a re reusable communication protocol that applications can use. Uh, but if they want to use something else, then that's fine. Yeah. Uh, the uh, the SDK con uh, using is is the LVM fifteen, uh, which that provides uh, risk five uh, support for the ZMUL subset. Uh, there is a minimal runtime, basically just boots for applications. There are some small, low-level uh, convenience functions. Uh, and also we have the MonoCypher crypto library uh, that we like very much uh, available. Uh, uh, and of course there's a header file defining all the MMIU things that you can talk to, the touch sensor and, and, the, and the TRNG for example. Uh, the QEMI model, uh, it emulates all the MMI exposed hardware functions. So you have the timer, you have, a, uh, you have the touch sensor, for example, and, and whatnot. Uh, and you can uh, able to run firmware uh, uh, and load application uh, inside of the QM. Uh, and we have some ex example applications and documentations. Uh, apps are written in, in C for the moment, but uh, there's been an attempt doing it in Rust, and those are running in, in, in QM right now, uh, not on the hardware yet. Though. So uh, the, the keynote today talked about, about, about supply chains, uh, so I must probably change a little bit. I'm talking about supply chain here, but what I mean is uh, the supply chain from, from Telitis, from us to you. But basically I said, how can you trust that uh, the, the Telitis key that you get from us is the one that you bought or ordered or got? Uh, uh, and how do we ensure the, the security and integrity of the Telitis key devices themselves? Uh, so we have a mechanism for that. Uh, so basically we, we, we provision uh, the keys, the manufactured keys, in a secure environment. It's a lockdown room, there is no internet in there, no computer connected anyways. We generate the unique device secret and the uh, and device identity, uh, and we don't store that afterwards. Uh, uh, we generate a unique FPDI bitstream with those fields inserted, the UDS and UDI, and it's written into the NVC and part of the FPGA. And then we, 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 we glue together the, the enclosure, uh, the casing of, of the device, and we test it. And then we can send it to you. But when we do this, when, when the device has been manufactured, we, we load the sign insider application onto the device to generate a public key. And we take that one out. We also perform a challenge response to ensure that we that actually happens something, that it works something. It's not just something that burps out the public key. Uh, so we actually perform a challenge response signing operation. Uh, we record the public key, uh, and we also record the hash of the application that was loaded. So we know that given the, that, in, in, that key and that application, loaded on the application, we should be able to get that specific public key for that with the device that has that, that UDS. Uh, so, and, and we create a, a record, uh, one there showing that that is my key, that's the one here. Uh, so that's how it looks like. Uh, and we can see that when it was created, when the record was created, we can see the, the app we used and the hash for it, and then the signature, the public key uh, that I have, that has been signed by our private key. Because we use, our own devices and own our own T key with our own key pair signer to sign the record. And we push that to GitHub pages. Uh, so everything is on, on GitHub pages. Yeah. And we use sign commits of course when we push stuff to GitHub. So when you as a user receive uh, your T key device, you can run the T key verification tool and it will load the signing app application onto your device to be able to get the UDI, the, the device identity, and be able to get, get the public key generated uh, for that device. It will then talk to the GitHub pages 
and find that record for that specific key and then perform a verification. It will perform a uh, response and it will verify that the, the, sign, the, 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 the public key that was signed by our private key is correct. Uh, so then we know that the, the device that you got actually works and it has not been tampered with from us to you. Uh, and as you can see here, we, we actually use our own devices with dog from keys and applications uh, for doing all this. So the state of today, uh, so we did Tiki 1, the first version of the key device has been released and is being delivered to customers. Uh, there has been performed a, a security audit of the Tiki 1 design. Uh, the report is not published yet, it's being finalized, but when it's finalized it will be published. You should be able to know what, we, what the finding was and what we fixed. Uh, so the Tiki SSH agent has been released. It's available and can works for Linux, Windows, Mac OS. Uh, we have some other applications that are available, like a uh, random number generator uh, and, and device verification. Uh, and as I mentioned, there's a crypto third-party application that was released uh, around Christmas last year uh, that you can use. That's a good example of other people taking the T key and be able to build applications for it. Uh, we also work with repository reproducer builds. You can give them the Docker images for the tools, so you have the right versions of everything. You should be able to generate the, uh, the these, uh, give, uh, giving the UDS and the UDI, there are some, there's some default versions of those in the repository. You should be able to get, generate the correct FBA bitstream, the firmware, and, and uh, everything. Uh, and also the TK device apps. Uh, and the TK Recreation client is also reproducible. build on that. Uh, uh, and as I said, we have a device recreation in service uh, using GitHub pages. And once again, 100% open source, everything is released on GitHub. Uh, and to find us, in short, it's, it, this is an open-ended computer with focus on other candidate use cases. So, uh, so you, 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 the function that the key performs is based or given by the application loaded onto the device. Uh, one interesting aspect of this is that the client system decides on what apps to execute. If you think of a server, not like a, a laptop, uh, a server could actually decide on what, what application to push that it wants you to use on your key to be able to authenticate you. It could be all kinds of uh, different uh, applications. But it's, it's a, the, so the, the key does not perform anything before it's powered up and the application has been loaded onto it. Yeah. One thing with this is that there's no need to get a new, a new T key uh, to get a support for a new protocol or standard. It's just another, another application. Uh, you don't have to look through a, a product sheet and see if it supports this or that and, and decide what you need to use it. And you, you get the T key and then you can either yourself or, or someone else develops the application that you need to support your use case. It also means that the organizers can adapt and integrate the TK into their requirements and their systems as they see fit. Uh, I mentioned there's no flash memory in the, in the FPGA that you can sort of store the application from that. Uh, so it's no persistent memory, it is blank. That means that there's no leakage of assets from the key if, not, if, if, uh, if you lose it. Uh, and there's no spreading, and I can't spell it, no spreading of malware. Uh, and yet again, uh, it's one of the open source, uh, from tooling, from the documentation, all the way down to hardware. Uh, the hardware, as you can see, is minimal in hardware and firmware, so it's pretty easy to audit. Uh, and we do have reproducible builds, so you can actually trust that we, do, you, uh, we, we build is something you can use. Uh, and we have the virtual devices from us to you. So that's questions. Let's start with a hand in the back.
Thank you very much for that talk. Um, I have a question to the Tiki apps. Is there any way to ascertain that the app has been actually produced by or desired by the owner of the chip? So do you do something like secure boot or checking a signature of the app or is that explicitly outside of your threat model? It's, uh, since we measure the application as part of loading it, uh, if something has been tampered with it, uh, it's, uh, uh, then the, the CDI that we calculate will be different. Uh, but no, there's no check that there's no other signature so that this, this was generated by something else and it's really the application. Uh, it's, it's a raw risk five uh, binary, basically. Uh, that's all they want to advise. But the integrity of the application, that's the really important thing, is part of the measurement. Yeah. You're spreading out one hand at the back, one hand at the front. Mm -hmm. yeah. Get an exercise. Yeah, the really awkward step length in the stairs. <laughs> So, uh, basically you said that you need around two minutes to compile the byte stream, right? Come uh, You need around two minutes to, comp to compile the byte stream for the, yeah. uh, the specific deleted key. And you said that you are now producing one byte stream for every key. Yeah. How could that scale if you want to increase production? That's a good question. Uh, right now we can... Uh, uh, we, we, we build FPGAs in batches. Uh, so, say we want to produce 50 of them, and we, we start up the, the generation and then take a coffee. Yeah? Uh, and, and, uh, but we are working on ways to not having to rebuild the whole FPGA, just change the parts of the, of the bitstream that contains the UDS and the UDI. Uh, and that's also one of the good things with, with using NextPNR and, and those open tools, that the bitstream format is is documented and it's open. Doing that to, for example, a bitstream for for uh, uh, signing FPGA would be impossible. I also have a follow-up key. Uh, since you are basically programming or setting the bitstream of the FPGAs at uh, well, deletes or whatever is it you are manufacturing them. How can you provide, provide a warranty that the firmware, well, the bitstream that you're uploading to the key has not been modified by you in order to insert some kind of backdoor? So basically, yeah, how to trust us? Uh, well, that's... Uh, uh, I need to think about how to do that in... Uh, so that, so that, that, that must not come down to human trust and it's hard to sort of uh, make build technical solutions around. Uh, what you can trust is that we, when we publish stuff on, on, on GitHub, it's always side by us, but then it comes down to do you trust us to doing this? And, and uh, I, it's, it's hard to, to be able to do that fully, uh, but uh, we're reluctant to, to talk about more about how to do that, in a, how can we be even more transparent than we are? Uh, Looking for more hands. Can we have one more? Yeah, thank you for the talk today. Um, I wonder if um, uh, this support OpenSSL uh, compatibility, like uh, PKCS Celebrum OpenSSL engine interface, something like that. Uh, good question. Uh, uh, we should be able to, to, to support some like PKC uh, eleven. Uh, there is we, we should be able to take, for example, what we did in in, in Cryptek, the, the PKC eleven uh, um, parser is available there as open source, and it should fit inside of the TT. Uh, so we should be able to handle uh, that IPI, for example. Uh, haven't looked at doing that yet, but it's really interesting, I think. Uh, so you can do have use this as a as a set, as a as a HSM ish something that's really slow, really tiny, but could perform the typical PKC level operations. Uh, 
we have everything that we need really to do that inside of hardware and should be able to handle that in terms of uh, application size. So if there, are, there is one more hand, then I will ask my obvious question last. Uh, so when there's like a security vulnerability possibly found in existing versions, you have to like make a new uh, iteration of the keys, right? Is there like a policy for what happens in such a scenario? Sorry, come again. Can you? Oh, um, so when, uh, for example, the nitro key or uh, like all these other keys, when they have uh, issue on their keys, they need to make a new version with those issues patched. And they have policies like uh, giving you a new key or like certain stuff. I was wondering what um, the T key would try to do in such a scenario. So meaning a path for, for existing users to yeah, uh, I would sort of, uh, the guy behind you is the CEO for, for, for uh, Tilidis, so I probably should answer, but, uh, but to the, from the technical side, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a point in, in that we don't have a firmware update path or support in this device. It is locked down. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, we, it, it's, as I said, four kilobytes. It's basically just loading applications and starting them. That's nothing else, uh, and uh, so and we do have done an audit of it, and so hopefully it's not going to be any uh, or any uh, security issues in in the firmware. But if there really is, then, then we have to figure out something. Yeah. Then I want to ask about Doom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so, so you had a serial port, so you can still do ASCII graphics, I think. Yeah, so, yeah, so yeah. Tell that in there, there's, there's actually an, an RGB LED on, on the device, so I was thinking like, like if you shake your head really fast, then you can probably f figure out a different way. No, but seriously, it should be able to run, but then you probably need to have a client application that sort of performs the frame buffer, uh, but that should work. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Any okay. more questions or early lunch? Looks like early lunch. So thank you very much. Lunch. Thank you.